are these people? Let's get to the UAW. Holy moly. Mike Elk from Payday Report is one of the better independent reporters out there. He's been doing this a long time, reporting on unions and reporting on rank and file worker perspective and their attempts to organize against the bosses. He tends to sometimes get a little pro rah rah about the union leadership itself, but I think that he's really starting to figure it all out, especially about the UAW. And we've been talking a lot about Sean Fain and the UAW and how the federal monitor has been charging them with A, withholding documents, but also with corruption. And now with last week, we, we talked about how they were corruption. how they were punishing and uh, attention that employees were afraid to speak out for fear of retaliation by senior management. All right. So now we hear that the federal monitor is investigating his purge of top allies while a convicted felon steers UAW legal. Wait, a convicted felon? Yeah. That that's uh, also happening, huh? Yes, a convicted felon. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. So I want to, depending on what the felony is. <laughs> this article is is long. No? I will say it's broken up into four parts, and he's got it sectioned off. Um, and we're gonna go section by section, and we'll take a little break in between and talk about them because they're a little bit different for each one. Let's go back here. All right. First part is about the federal monitor. So he says this month, the UAW federal monitor, Neil Borofsky, accused the UAW, which is under a federal consent decree, of refusing to turn over documents regarding the demotion of UAW Secretary of Treasurer Margaret Mock and UAW Vice President Rich Boyer. Again, this is the same thing that we've been talking about, that they blew the whistle and said that during the stand-up strike, they were making promises to the workers that they knew they weren't able to keep. All right. Payday Report has now learned that the top that UAW President Sean Fain's top legal advisor, Nathaniel Charney, is a convicted felon who pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice charges for hiding information regarding embezzlement in the Teamsters in the 1990s. 25 years later. Charney and his legal team are accused again of hiding information from the union's membership. Do we see a pattern here? As we always do. The federal monitor seeks to obtain thousands of internal un union emails regarding the purge of some UAW President Sean Fain's top allies, including, like we said, Secretary of Treasurer Margaret Mock and VP of Stellantis, Rich Boyer, but of course the UAW has resisted. <laughs> a court ordered confidential survey of several hundred UAW staffers showed that 40% of the UAW staffers feared retaliation if they spoke about problems within the UAW. Again, we covered this last week. Borofsky, yep. who won praise from many progressives for his role as the special inspector for TARP, which, if you remember, was that, it, you know, just after the bailouts in the 2008 congressional thing, um, they had him as a special inspector to make sure that the money was being paid back or being used appropriately, right? That was during the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. He's facing, all right, facing a smear attack from Ryan Grimm. You know Ryan Grimm? Oh, Unfortunately, autopilot. I'd like to not, you know, previously of the intercept sunshine of the spotless mind that that'd be nice. Currently of, you know, breaking points or whatever the his breaking the point or whatever his stupid show is over there on top of, oh, here you go. Counterpoint. He's going to mention that now he just launched his own. Recently, pub, pub, recently launched his own publication, Drop Site News with Jeremy Scahill. I've got a lot to say about that, too. We can talk about it. We're going to cover that in another night. But Grimm is a progressive superstar <clears throat> with over 350,000 followers on Twitter and is the host of the hit web show Counterpoint, which has over 1 million subscribers on YouTube. That's not really fair. Can you stop embarrassing yourself? That's not really fair to say because Counterpoint doesn't have a million 
Breaking points does. No. And Counterpoint is a Friday afternoon show or something, a one show out of the entire network that they claim. Now, Grimm recently won praise for questioning the New York Times reporting on sexual assaults committed by Hamas during its attack on October 7th, two months after the gray zone. Yeah, like eight squirreled. months late. Right? Right. Now... He's used his perch as a respected journalist to run a hit job accusing Neil Borofsky, who's Jewish, of having a secret Zionist agenda in his role as the UAW's federal monitor. The union has called for a ceasefire uh -huh. in Gaza. However, however, this I is mean, very important. Nowhere in Ryan Grimm's reporting on UAW's federal monitor has he disclosed that his managing editor and co-founder of Dropsite News Nausicaa Renner is married to the director of the UAW Communications, Jonah Furman. We've actually read several okay. Jonah Furman articles on this on this show. Jonah used to have his own publication called Who Gets the Bird? He reported on Labor News. He reported for Labor News, literally. And then he got hired by Teamsters for a Democratic Union, I believe. And he started pushing teamster propaganda and he sold the shitty UPS deal for the teamsters mm -hmm. to their membership on the quote unquote left claiming that it was a win. We debunked all of that crap in real time. Mm -hmm. Let me continue. Furman controls the UAW's multi-million dollar budget media budget and is a powerful figure within the labor movement. He's given work to scores of progressive videographers and communicators and used the power of the UAW's vast social media space to make the work of their preferred journalists go viral. He's never done that for us, I can tell you right now. <laughs> now, mm -hmm. through interviews with UAW members, legal experts, and a review of legal documents, Payday reporters learned that Grimm's reporting, based on one anonymous source, is not accurate. Go we'll figure. In our 16-month-long investigation, Payday Report has discovered a troubling and well-documented pattern of intimidation and retaliation against those who speak up against misconduct in the UAW. I don't think that's any surprise to us. All right? Unbelievable. At a time when the UAW has taken a major setback following the defeat of the Union Drive at the Mercedes plant in Alabama, this expose by Payday Report raises troubling questions about the dysfunctionality and abuse of employees within the UAW by the Fain administration. Remember, these mostly are employees of the big three. They're not even employees necessarily of just the UAW. He says, in quote, in the words of union employees, that internal audit reported to be representative of this cohort the union needs to end the toxic idea that fear is a motivator, correct the retaliation, and remove the culture of fear of retribution at the union. And that's what Borowski wrote himself. Okay, he's a federal monitor. And he's, designed, he's there. And look, the Biden administration is tongue bathing, you know, having a big tongue kiss right now with the UAW leadership. We know this. They're totally in bed with Sean Fain. So... For one of their own, for one of their monitors, federally appointed, to be saying this, that's got to be real problems, okay? So, what the hell is going on? But we knew that he had purged three top quote-unquote allies that had flipped on him, all right, because they had seen what he was doing corruption-wise, Sean Fain, and they... We're trying to let the membership know. All right. So yep. let me let me I'm let sure me they got rewarded for their for their courage. Yeah, let, let me stop there. Yeah, because everyone says they can't stand Ryan Graham. Hi, Heidi Benner. Good to see you. Yep. He didn't get a grim job yet, but we're gonna get one. Oh boy. Juan Guido showing up in chat. I don't think that's the same Juan Guido that that is it? That doesn't look like the same guy. Ryan Grimm definitely might be cutting his own hair. I I think that's a rug, honestly. I don't even think that's his own hair anyway. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, 
let's get back to what Sean Fain is doing in purging his allies. Oh, you know what? Before we did that, I wanted to drop this real quick. That anyone that could potentially help us support independent media, we really appreciate it. We are going to be raising money toward uh, supporting the Zago brothers for the next couple of months toward their independent cartoon art for representing all the Indie Media Award honorees. Um, we're going to be releasing that probably when we do the 2024 awards later this year. Um, I already have some of the, the, the art and it, it looks incredible. I can't wait for everyone else to see it. But, you know, Lucio's got a bunch to, to still work on. So we're going to wait for him to finish. All right. Shout out to, to Zago Brothers. If you're not following at Z-A-G-O Brothers on Twitter, give them a follow. They're also on Instagram. Just, just start searching Z-A-G-O. You'll find them. So. Ah, oh, my goodness. I'm doing a show with autopilot. No. <laughs> what the hell? Thanks, what OBS. Really appreciate that. Thanks, OBS. So you got to, yeah. Sean Fain has purged three top allies. We know. <laughs> Again, we've mentioned Margaret Mock, who is who was a secretary of treasure. They stripped her of her responsibility overseeing various projects and, and departments in the UAW, right? That was in February that they had announced this. Two years earlier, Fain, a white Bible-quoting factory worker from rural Indiana, had tapped Mock a black auto worker from Detroit to be his running mate. During the campaign, incumbent UAW president Ray Curry, a black man from North Carolina, made issues of Fane being white. So, Mock's inclusion as a black woman undoubtedly helped Fane's ticket win narrowly with only 483 votes cast out of a total of 136,485 votes from the potential UAW rank and file. Wait, what? Yep. Less than a year after serving as Fane's running mate, again, the lowest attended and the, and the lowest out turnout of any union in the history of the United States. Less than a year after serving as Fane's running mate, her demotion shocked many, particularly black union members who constitute approximately 25% of the UAW's membership. So, a concerned UAW member says that without Margaret Mock, there's no way that Fane beats Curry, and it's shocking that no one has clear answers about what's happening. Well, we, we kind of know what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. In the wake of a federal scandal that saw many UA top UAW officers go to jail on charges of embezzlement, bribery, and self-enrichment, Mock implemented an open bid process that made the union's financial spending practices more transparent and tried to move the UAW away from a system of political patronage that has existed in the union for many decades. Away from a system of political patronage. Okay, do you hear those words? Remember uh -huh. those words. That sounds nice to me. But her new accountability measures angered Fane, who successfully sought to have her demoted in February, claiming that she was hindering the UAW's ability to quickly spend money on key organizing projects. After Where's the money, Lebowski? Yeah, right. After her demotion, Mock filed a complaint with Federal Monitor Neil Borowski to investigate. And... As, as she should, right? She said in a statement to the Detroit Free Press, quote, when policies are established by the UAW International Executive Board and or by the special monitor ordered by the court to oversee the UAW and or by federal agencies, it's my responsibility when these policies concern UAW finances to diligently make sure these policies are adhered to. Makes sense, right? While it saddens me uh -huh. even further that I get criticized, attacked, and retaliated against because I insist on the policies that are in place be adhered to, I will not waver in enforcing financial policies intended to protect our members' sacred dues dollars. Uh, yeah! Fire! 
Well, demoted at least. No, worse. They didn't fire her. They tried to manage her out so that she would quit. As part of that, uh, as part of that federal consent decree, a federal judge, as a reminder, appointed Neil Borowski to be the federal monitor of the UAW in 2021. Why? Because they got they got uh, indicted for embezzling a million dollars. I believe it was Ray Curry himself. Under the federal consent decree, Borowski has the right to demand emails about internal decision making over spending matters and publish the information in regular reports. UAW members read the reports religiously as they debate the union's tactics and strategies. Union members were clamoring for more information about what was happening to the top leaders. Quote, the head of the UAW removing the VP, that's huge. And that's a UAW union president. That's Eric Fleming. He told Detroit News, there's confusion on the plant floor. As, as you should. Right? Margaret Mock requested that Borowski investigate these matters and publish independent findings so that rank-and-file UAW members could have a clear idea of the feud between the union's elected leaders. Because we now we all also know that in addition to Mock being demoted, and we, again, we've reported on this, we reported on this last month, UAW's VP for Stellantis Workers, Rich Boyer, was also removed from office for dereliction of duty, as Fain told union members last May, except... After reaching deals with Ford and GM during the stand-up strike, nonsense, the union rushed to reach a deal with Stellantis as well. The quickly reached deal agreed to controversial language that has resulted in the layoffs of thousands of Stellantis temporary workers. Now, as the summer progressed and layoffs intensified at Stellantis, Boyer faced criticism from UAW, from UAW leadership. Now, he claims that Fain and his senior staff including Benjamin Dichter, who's a lawyer, and Chris Brooks, who were they were aware and pushed the deal by the UAW at Stellantis, that all the UAW was in on this and pushed it. It wasn't him. He says, your action against me implies, and he wrote this open letter. Damn, he burned it all down. He just let it all, he, he spilled all the tea. I love it. Your action against me implies that your staff had no visibility or involvement in our discussions during the 2023 negotiations with Stellantis? It's unreal. He says, that was a blatant lie, insult, and a personal attack on my credibility. Right? R that Rich was a lie. That was a lie, sir. Boyer says that he had opposed several of Fane's spending decisions. Right? In particular, he had opposed his attempt to give his romantic partner and her sister an enhanced early retirement as part of their leaving the joint UAW <laughs> Chrysler National Training Center. Hey, bro, enhanced early retirement is like what you can get prescribed in Canada. All right? That does not... That does not... Um, not at the great. UAW. No, what you First get... All, what you get is a very nice package... <laughs> Financial sever a financial package oh, to walk away from nice the company. Package. I yeah. see. Yeah, fifty thousand couple a year or two's worth of salary plus benefits and pension and all kinds of goodies to to walk away at this point, and then you're free to go do whatever the hell mm. you want and earn another income if you want. There's nothing stopping you, right? So when running against UAW incumbent President Ray Curry in 2022. Remember that Will uh, Will Lehman from uh, WSWS also was running uh, from Socialist Party, and he's now still suing them in federal court, and he won a lawsuit about this um, because they were stonewalling him from being able to communicate with the membership about his candidacy. It was crazy. They just wanted to make sure, like this, duopoly. It had to either be incumbent... No, it wasn't Curry that, that did the... The corruption. It was it was the one before Ray Curry. He replaced them. Um, but what about Steph Curry? It might have been. No, he's he's a basketball player. Sports. Mm. But but when he was running against Sports. Ray Curry in 2022, Fain and his allies heavily criticized the practice of keeping relatives and romantic partners on the union payroll. And then he did the same thing. They attacked the previous union president, Rory Gamble, for having his son employed at the center. Right, and that's that. Uh, mm. National Training Center for UAW Chrysler. Penn Union. It's like a lot of company ink. 
It is. And Union no. and... Th yeah, but it's not Company Inc. It's Union and Company Inc. Remember, it's a third-party broker intervening is, that isn't just representing the workers right. at Chrysler. They're representing a lot more people, mm. and they have their own interests and, and priorities. And it ain't necessarily the workers at Stellantis overall. All right? But... 10 union and three Fiat Chrysler executives have been charged with using center funds to finance their lavish lifestyles. And some are already in jail. That's what Chris Brooks had written in 2019. That's who was mentioned earlier. But of course the center served another purpose as a source of jobs, including sham jobs for friends and family of union officials. And then Bain turns around and does the same thing four years later. Really? As people within the UAW raised questions about the employment of Fane's romantic partner and her sister, talks began about how to figure out a way for the two to leave the union. As part of the negotiations, Fane requested that his partner and her sister receive an enhanced retirement package so that they could retire early. To avoid having the enhanced early retirement package raise regulators' eyebrows, he then requested that every worker at the training center get the same bump, a provision that Boyer objected to as being too costly. So basically, he wants to give mm. everyone a raise so that his girlfriend and her sister could get raises on the way out and get a better severance on the way out. <laughs> All right. That's sure. And, nice Boyer, guy, and, like. and Boyer said, no, that's crazy. I were, I'm the Chrysler rep. That doesn't make any financial sense to UAW. Now, I, I always want to see people get paid more, but not if it's because the guy wants his girlfriend and, and her sister to get paid more on the way out. That's kind of messed up. Right? I, I, and maybe it's not. Maybe, and I, I'm guessing they did this anyway because they fired Boyer, the demotion of Fane's running mate, and top Vice President in Stellantis continues a troubling pattern of Fane purging his top allies when they don't agree with him. Yeah. I, apparently, I've been accused of the same thing here at INN, but I don't run a major union, so fuck all that. We run a little shitty YouTube channel. <laughs> in March of 2023, Fane Report obtained documents showing that Fane had already fired his previously handpicked chief of staff and most of, and his, most of his previously chosen top senior staffers. I think that's because they knew all about what he was all about. The mass firings came after Rio and then top Fane staffers raised concerns about the top-down approach of a controversial Brooklyn-based union consultant, Chris Brooks. After other staffers... Freeze. Freeze. After other staffers raised similar concerns... Bain also fired several top allies, and I'm not going to name them because there's like five of them, but later Susan Pratt, another one, a sixth, chose to resign in solidarity with them. Rio addressed concerns regarding the dismissal of Fane's previously selected senior leadership team and its implication for the UAW reform movement in a five-page memo written February 22nd after his dismissal last year. And there was a story in Payday Report last year about that. Um, and Mike covered that. That's what he was trying to say, because Mike's good. All right. Bain's senior top staffers had expressed their concern about naming an inexperienced, white, social media savvy former labor writer to a top leadership position within the very racially diverse UAW. Feels, man. Vibes and feels. The union's previous incumbent president, Ray Curry, is also a 58-year-old black man from North Carolina. I don't know not why race really... That. Right. Not that anything, I don't know why race is playing into this at all, but I'm <laughs> guessing that, that Mike's going to get to that. Petty Report obtained a five-page memo in which Rio uh, voiced similar concerns that Brooks, a longtime Brooklyn-based union consultant routinely downplayed and short-shrifted the perspectives of black workers. That's why. Furthermore, the group of close Fane allies expressed deep concerns that Brooks, who Fane has chosen as his right-hand man despite never having worked for the UAW or been a member of a UAW bargaining unit, 
operated in a style that could severely hurt the UAW reform movement. Because that's the plan, guys. In June of 2020, Brooks drew heavy criticism when he dismissed the possibility that Black Lives Matter was inspiring a massive upsurge of strike activities in the early stages of the pandemic. I think it might have been the yep. pandemic, too. It wasn't just BLM. Which, which they should have been doing. 100%. Like, I, I like how they're like, oh, God, we can't have more strikes. You're a union. People want to do it. Do it. Well, no, nobody I wants to not work hard. and earn money and earn $500 a week strike pay, but they want to hold the bosses yeah, accountable and they're earn saying more. That yes, they're voting. The, to act you. Yep. the activity was... Like, people were wanting to do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, they saw what was happening in the streets already. They're like, we can do that. You know, sure. you're already losing a lot of work from pandemic. Like, you know. Well, as he says. I just find it crazy that that was like a sticking point for them. Yes, it is. You know? It is crazy. Um, Brooks's comments led many black leaders to criticize him as racially tone deaf for saying that. Um, again, saying that Black Lives Matter was dismissing the the possibility mm -hmm. that BLM was inspiring a, an upsurge of strike activity. Right. So. Yeah. He said, "My concerns and the concerns shared by the team members listed above are that." Chris has assumed a role in the transition and in your future administration that he does not possess the experience or personal maturity to care to carry out. You're talking about representing hundreds of thousands of workers nationwide. Right. In a short time, mm -hmm. his lack of transparency, his need for control over departmental discussions. That's weird. Micromanagement his near to his need to control access to you. And his apparent lack of, of ability to work in a real collaborative manner became apparent. So after Rio and his allies left Fane's transition team, right, Chris Brooks proposed that the union engage in the purges of staffers uh, in the union that was narrowly divided during the union's presidential election in 2023. Brooks suggested that UAW leadership investigate its workforce to see who was loyal. He wanted a Gestapo, is what he's looking for. Okay? Sure. He says, ID those who, can, who we can work with, move the program, ID those who need to be purged, he wrote in an email obtained by the Detroit, by the Detroit Free Press last year. That's the paper mm. of record in Detroit, uh, Gannett owned. The demotion of the UAW's Black Secretary Treasurer, Margaret Mock, brought again back to the surface a feeling of uneasiness among union members, particularly Black union members, because in court documents, Borowski is now charging the UAW with failing to turn over information about Fane's purge of his allies. Did somebody say some racist shit in those emails and they don't want to turn them over to a federal monitor? Could that possibly be happening here? Tired of hearing about your damn emails. Again, Neil, he, <laughs> we're going to hear from Neil Borowski again. In court documents last month, no. as of the date of this report, we said more than... Three months after a monitor's initial document request, the union has produced a very small portion, only 2,600, of the currently potentially, a current potentially relevant pool of approximately 116,000 intentionally. And with more than 80% of those documents only produced days before the issuance of this report. There has been a similar lack of production for the monitor's embezzlement investigation into one of the union's regional directors. What? Yes, they're stonewalling all over the place. Because what happened? The union has justified its delays by advancing arguments that the decisions regarding Mock's demotion were privileged information. It's classified. I, I can't tell you. That's privileged steeped in privilege, right? However, 
Both the Justice Department, which is overseeing the consent decree of the UAW, and the Federal Monitor have rejected this argument. So they've already been ordered to do this, and yet they're just not. If access is given to the documents, it could hurt Fain politically within the union, giving Fain, the Fain administration a motive to conceal them. Yes. All right. Um, Horowski's Federal Monitor reports... Uh, paint a troubling picture within the UAW, the UAW of union staffers and leaders frustrated by Fain's quest to consolidate his power base and purge union leaders that he sees as, again, disloyal. Again, these are people that call Trump authoritarian. They try to call Trump a, a Hitler dictator. Listen to what's going on here. Anyone that has any mm -hmm. type of dissenting opinion is purged. You see, we're a family here. Yeah. You gotta be loyal to the family. Reason. Forget about it. A recent culture assessment <sighs> conducted by the union's internal audit function uncovered remnants of that culture still at the union. On the one hand, there were several positive aspects of the culture assessment with most union staff members reporting that they feel a strong sense of mission and purpose, driven employment, gain a sense of personal fulfillment from their work, and feel motivated and inspired by the UAW's identity, in spite of Sean Fain and all of this. All right. However, while the UAW and its telegenic president, Sean Fain, were getting good press, a survey of hundreds of UAW staffers conducted by the Monitor's office, showed that feelings within the UAW were also very troubling. And he says, based on hundreds of anonymous survey responses, the culture assessment also found divisions and silos within the union that are negatively impacting the union's culture. For example, the survey revealed that a concerning number of union personnel continued to fear retaliation if they were to report misconduct and that many harbor the same kinds of concerns that were present at the start of the monitorship. Start of the monitorship being 2019, I believe. Mm. Borofsky's 124-page report was sent to the UAW's 300,000 members and widely read. For many union members, it raised deep questions about Fane's purge within the UAW. This was the first time a lot of them were even hearing about this. Quote, although the monitor will make no judgment on whether the actions of the president were appropriate until after he concludes the investigation described in the monitor's ninth status report, these events have been perceived by union staff that has already had significant concerns about a culture of fear of retribution as confirmation that even the highest ranked union officials can be subject to retaliation, wrote Borowski in July. Yeah, no one is safe. If you're next, if you're standing next to Fane and you question him, he's going to cut you out because we know that he really works for the Democratic Party. So the minute you start questioning the Democratic Party or their methods or the donors, you're out. Specifically, reports to the monitor's hotline from union staff have cited the actions taken against the secretary treasurer and vice president as driving retaliation fears that... Um, reporting alleged abuses might lead to retribution from the president's office. That might lead to? No, did lead to. Given the fragility of the union's cultural perception of retaliation, whether they were appropriate or not, how these recent acts are perceived by the union staff must be taken into account when tackling this persistent cultural challenge. One longtime UAW leader joked with me that Fain was like, Walter Reuther, both in a good and bad way, you got to remember that Reuther purged a lot of people. Um, I don't know who There's Walter Reuther is. don't know who is Walter Reuther? I, I don't know. So okay. I'm guessing that he was an old UAW I'll, person. I'll do a Google. Yes, please look that up for me. Confidential data from Spell surveys. R-E-U-T-H-E-R. R-E-U-T-H-E-R. -E -E American civil rights activist. Ah. Okay. Um, 
so, organized labor and civil rights activists who put the United Automobile Workers into one of the most progressive labor unions in America. He was a history. former UAW union head. That's what I figured. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Confidential data from the surveys of several hundred UAW staff conducted by the monitor found a deep culture of fear within the UAW. Again, in the words of union employees, that internal audit reported to be representative of this cohort, the union needs to end the toxic idea that fear is a motivator, correct the retaliation, and remove the culture of fear and retribution at the union, wrote Borowski last month in that report. And that's federally publicly available. That was written for us. We paid for that as, as Americans. Mm. The data gathered during the survey underscores the widespread nature of the concerns of these staff members. For example, of the approximately 100 union staff who reported that they witnessed unethical behavior or misconduct, we again covered this last week, during the 12 months, over 30% said they didn't report it and all survey participants were asked why they didn't report it, and 40% of them said they declined to report it out of fear of retaliation. Calls to the monitor's hotline have independently and rep repeatedly echoed the same concerns. Like, he's not making it up. This is happening syst systemically and frequently, and across the board. Borowski had written that both famed secretary-treasurer and Vice President for Stellantis complained that they were removed from their assignments within the union because they wouldn't go along with spending requests from the UAW. Spending requests being the raises for Fane's girlfriend and her sister, which then would take into right. effect not just for them, but for everyone that had that title, which would have been a lot more money. The demotions had a chilling effect on the debate, on debate within the union, that specifically reports to the monitor's hotline from union staff have cited the actions taken against Secretary Treasurer and VP as a driving re as driving retaliation fears that reporting alleged abuses might lead to retribution from the president's office because he'll figure out where it came from. He says, given the fragility of the union of the union's cultural perception of retaliation, whether they were appropriate or not. How these recent acts were perceived by the union staff must be taken into account, like we said, when tackling this persistent cultural challenge. I think I read that before. All right. There's there's a lot more to this, too. And this is, like I said, I, Mike goes deep on this one, and he talks a lot about several different problems that all stem from one specific guy, Sean Fain. Now, they rigged, mm. the, you know, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be the one to, to make that accusation that somehow that election for him was rigged. They, they didn't send out the ballots to anyone. It was the first time the entire UAW membership, not just the Barnes and the captains, were given the ability to vote at the union. All right. And they didn't let anybody know. And they didn't tell anyone who was running. Again, 483 votes. 133,000 members. And I think there's even more than that. This is that, the most election of our lifetime. Well, they love appointing candidates. That's what the Democrats do, right? How is this different from an insurance company? You're right, Anna. They pay in their dues. Not insurance, in case shit. In case shit happens, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, so the United Auto Workers. UAW is the United Auto Workers. They're the ones that work for all the car companies. But UAW also has a lot of other union members that are not working for the UA uh, for one of the big three auto auto workers. They actually just recently unionized uh, a plant in um, was it for Audi or for Volkswagen? They, they, they just won one for Volkswagen in Tennessee and they lost one for Mercedes in Alabama, but there was a little bit of monkey business there too. CBC voter. Good to see you. All right, uh, Team Orca, I used to be a statistician of sorts. The amount of employer on employee violence is significantly higher than you would think. You bet. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Anna. It, it, if our channel was, well, we do have a shitty little, it's not a shitty little channel, but it's a little channel nonetheless. 
nobody's worried about our little channel was really what I meant to say. But um, senior leadership was a toddler. He still is a toddler right now. Ghostart is breaking news that Pizazel Smotrich orders the confiscation of 100 million shekels from the Palestinian Authority to compensate the Israeli families of those killed in the operation on October 7th. Ugh. Oh, boy. What a fucking... Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Anna Mayers, UAW has come to seem like a giant grift, and that's putting it mildly. Well, they're a protection racket is what they are. All right. And they're not even a very good one because they're not protecting their base. They're more in cahoots with the boss than they are with 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 the workers. All right. Yeah. You had one job and exactly they they couldn't do it. All right. Go start. Sixty thousand Americans live in illegal Jewish settlements in the West Bank. All right. As well as two hundred uh, twenty three thousand four hundred Americans. Oh, I guess it's cutting off. That's weird. Let me fix that. Twenty three thousand four hundred Americans. There we go. Hey, um, serving in the Israeli army. Wow, 23,000 Americans living, serving in the army. Many are posting videos on social media showing them committing war crimes, and I hope they're prosecuted when they come back home. As they should. As they should. As Kit Cabello would say, shout Ooh. out to our friend Kit. All right. Topher Is over that your excuse for a Chicagoan accent? I wouldn't even call that Chicago, but Topher over on with? Kick, over on Kick. I, oh no, he moved to over to uh, YouTube. Good to see you, Topher, over there. UAW hide stuff like Kamala's DA office. Very funny, very true. The mafia would be preferable to the UAW. I think you know, it'd be shame if something happened to your nice little job there. That's right. All right. I don't know yeah, if you have I'm any of the John you. Deere story in here. I don't have the John Deere story, but I know that they're. Also got screwed over. We reported on John Deere two years ago and how mad they were like, at what the UAW Jimmy, did. Hmm? Hoffa was breaking kneecaps, people. Yes, he but, was. You but know that, that's Teamsters. Um, like, but that's yeah, union. That's that's union leadership. Difference. And and uh, also, right. Not just uh, John Deere. Also, UAW was um, carrier, I believe. Carrier workers are mm. UAW, and there was one other one I'm thinking of uh, that, that just slipped my mind that we were talking about UAW members. And then, of course, there's the ones, the, the workers in California, that school workers are aligned with UAW. All right. Now it's Hurricane Debbie. Is that, that what they're calling it now? All right. Yeah. For, and, and then we got four ga so. Gators. Four Gators for Kit. Um, I'm retired. Uh, union deep dives don't interest me. Uh, okay, as long as my my make my run my money next Friday, next Friday coming, I didn't get the rent, and out the door I went. Um, yeah, speaking of getting paying the rent, and out the door I went. If you can support independent media and support our project for the Indie Media Awards to provide cartoon illustrations for all of the Indie Media Award honorees of their faces. And uh, we're going to, we'll do some really cool stuff with that. Zago's excited. He's seen some of the stuff that we're putting together, some of the artwork and some of the ways to incorporate that. We might put them into shirts. I don't know. It depends. We're going to have to get permission from the, the people themselves to use their face and their impression on a shirt and figure out how that might work. But we'll, we'll certainly make, make that available to everyone. And it'll be available at IndieMediaAwards.Substack.com. You'll see all of them there at some point. So here we got Longshoreman Union in the house. Look at them. Nice. Look at them doing it. Good shit. The Longshoreman. So, like I said, we're going to continue know? on what's happening in the UAW and that the uh, Bernie Bros from Brooklyn are pushing out the rank and file from the UAW communications office. This is another problem that's happening at the UAW. One person. The Bernie Bros from Brooklyn. This is, uh, again, Mike Those Elk. bad. Go ahead. I was just, it was just very alliterative. Was, my apologies. Big bad Bernie Bros yeah. from Brooklyn. That's right. Uh, this is Mike Elk That's from right. Payday Report. <laughs> PaydayReport.com. Uh, Not that org, but he, I believe it's non-profit. You can, it's tax deductible if you donate there. 
But what he's talking about is is in the communications office at UAW, one person who found their political patronage system threatened by Margaret Mock's open process is UAW communications director Jonah Furman, who controls the union's multi-million dollar budget. Yeah, we talked a little bit about Furman earlier. Jonah Furman is a D.C.-based union consultant who had previously worked as the top labor liaison for the Bernie Sanders campaign and at Labor Notes. All right, he also has his own Substack. Okay. Who gets the bird? Dot Substack. Dot com. Coming to a Substack newsletter near you. I knew she was coming. She's she's gonna nope. open one at some point. Rachel Maddow is coming to a Substack near you at some <laughs> point. I promise. With over sixty. Coming to a Substack newsletter near you. See, she just announced it right now. <laughs> With over 60,000 Twitter followers, Furman, like we said, is a social media powerhouse and commands a legion of labor fans who have turned Fane into the most famous labor leader in the country. Well, him and Sean O'Brien both. However. Yeah, I don't, and I also don't know about famous, but sure, you know, well, whatever. In, infamous, famous. El Guapo, yeah. do you know what that word means? Anyway. I mean, um, Chris is apparently chopped liver, I guess. But, you well, know. He's also unemployed at this whatever. point, I believe. But, however. I'm sure. Well, yeah. Members of the UAW's local union communication association, who is UAW Luca, complained that Furman was turning away from previous hires from the rank and file of UAW to hire Beltway Connected Consultants, hiring many of the talented content makers of the Bernie campaign. The hires paid off and made Fane a household name, but rank-and-file UAW members felt left excluded. Wow, this is an argument that we've been making for three years, that there is no representation of the mm. rank-and-file workers coming out of any PR department from any organized union. The Teamsters are starting to do it a little bit, Amazon Labor Union did it for about five minutes, and then they stopped. Um, hopefully, they may pick it up again, but we'll see what happens there. The latest round of hiring for the International UAW Communications Department is to be filled with all candidates that are non-UAW candidates. Why? Bringing the department to a ratio where less than half of the staff was UAW before entering the department, wrote the rank-and-file members in a leaked petition obtained by Payday Report. I wonder how he got that. This group of UAW local leaders signing it include Jesse Kelly of UAW 160 and Luigi Gukal and five or six others, all right, of different locals. Quote, we the undersigned of UAW Luca representatives petition a meeting with Jonah Furman. They just have to put out a petition to even ask for a meeting to discuss the recent decision and direction of the department to cease to use content that is created by rank and file UAW members until the international UAW communications department is represented by a majority of staff who were UAW members prior to accepting the role in the department. How are you supposed to represent the members? If you never worked there, don't even know them interact yeah. with them with fame yeah. facing increasing pressure from within the UAW and complaints that they lost a high profile UAW election in Alabama over a digital media heavy and organizing light model, he has increasingly relied on Furman to work his contacts in the press. Uh huh? We know about this. In June, Federal Monitor Neil Borowski filed a complaint in court asking a federal judge to order the UAW to hand over more documents. A rash of all of a sudden negative headlines appeared about the UAW. Then, a story relying on one anonymous source appeared accusing Borowski, like we said, who had served as a monitor investigating Credit Suisse for hiding Nazi money of having a Zionist bias. Huh. The UAW social monitor and social media influencer allies kicked into higher gear to brand Borowski as a Zionist, one who was upset over the UAW's position on Gaza and was retaliating by investigating Fane's controversial purges. Guess who he called? Okay. okay. Guess who he called? We'll, we'll get to um, that in a minute. 
Who did Jonah mm-hmm. Furman call? He had friends in the in, in the independent press. The reporting mentioned nothing about the court-ordered survey of hundreds of UAW employees that showed widespread fear of Fane's purges of allies suspected of disloyalty. Of course, that never was mentioned. Look at the beginning of the next paragraph. Ryan Grimm, the author of the viral hit piece uh-huh. that relied on a single anonymous source, which might have been Jonah Furman's wife for all we know, failed to mention one key point, that his top editor was married to Jonah Furman. Hmm. Mm. That might be a conflict of interest. Slightly. It might be. Now, on top of all of that, the ADL threatens the UAW with an anti-BDS lawsuit. I love this. So, you know, the UAW, you know, has called for um, an end to the, to the siege in Gaza. They want, you know, they, they called for a ceasefire very tepidly while yeah. endorsing the Democrats and not really calling for it. But the rank and file membership certainly wants it to stop. I mean, we certainly see right. that. even calling for it at this point. Like we we've talked about this. We've we've had these discussions, you know. Ceasefire is like the bare minimum half measure. Yep. Like, uh, you know, like it's almost like you could, you could just say that, you know, but they're not calling for like single Palestinian liberated state, clearly. Like. No, no but definitely sure. not. You know, d- democratic, independent, non-secular return to right. the people that were running it before 1948 state because yeah. the whole thing was yeah, that's a whole mm-hmm. other story let's look into we, we you can look into exactly what the that story is before but anyway <clears throat> getting back to the article that the adl threatened the uaw with an anti-bds lawsuit wait what yes well the adl is hysterical and crazy Jonathan Greenblatt, we know all about the ADL and how much yes. influence they actually have over corporate media, right? And I've over got whole you know, segments on it. Yes, they literally the accuse everyone of, uh, of, of what is it? Anti- being antiseptic, right? Racism and antisepticism and, you know, so all that jazz. In early July, Ryan Grimm autopilot left the intercept and launched a new nonprofit site called drop site news with famed intercept founder jeremy scahill thank you otto i'm now doing the show with autopilot yeah. if everyone didn't know that's on the podcast <laughs> the site's first viral article was entitled and they launched this thing quote the uaw's federal monitor twice pressured the union to back off its call for a gaza ceasefire then launched an investigation that's such crap. Grimm thinks he's got a big scoop, wrote, Borowski's pursuit of fame has less to do with concerns over self union self-dealing and has more to do with the politics of Israel-Palestine. Hmm, maybe he was covering for his editor's husband? I don't know. Stop, stop, stop trying to hide Reef, Otto. Come on. <laughs> Grimm wrote, Borowski's pursuit of Fain has less to do, like he said, with concerns over union self-dealing and more to do with the politics of Israel-Palestine. Bullshit. Bullshit, Ryan Grimm. I call bullshit. As his evidence, Autopilot presented a potential legal threat issued by Jonathan Greenblatt and the hysterical Zionist ADL against the UAW's local 7092 at, at NYU. And the new school. Remember, we covered that. UAW activists at the schools had been calling for BDS against Israel for the ongoing campaign of genocide that Israel has pursued in Gaza. Mike Elk is also Jewish, by the way. Thank goodness. You know, for (laughs) for the Jews like us that stand up and stand against what's going on there. As he says, New York State's first in the nation anti-BDS law requires state and local governments to divest from any group engaged in BDS calls. That's insane. 
I think Texas did that too, and same with Georgia. But I think it got overturned in Georgia. I remember that Abby Martin famously fought it and took it to federal court in Georgia and won. With the UAW representing public and graduate employees at public universities, the state could be forced to divest from the UAW's pension and retirement funds or possibly even not provide dues checkoff for the union. New York state law uh, okay. yep, has allowed the state to strip unions of, do, of dues checkoff if they violate state law. Um, okay. It'd be a little difficult to collect money. Having yep. been sent a serious legal threat, Borowski informed UAW President Sean Fain of the threat in December and forwarded the letter from the ADL to the IEB. That's the International Executive Board. Quote, although this issue is outside of the monitor's jurisdiction, we thought it was important to forward the message to the IEB, given the serious concerns raised here. He's not telling them they have to do this. He's saying that they should act. He's not telling them what to do. He's saying right. now, he did say what his opinion was, but it was just, but he asserts that it's his opinion. He says, for what it's worth, as I previously shared with Sean, similar concerns were raised directly to me shortly after the IEB issued its own ceasefire statement. But it doesn't necessarily say that he has a problem with it. In an yeah. IEB executive, in an IEB meeting attended by top UAW officials, Borowski again brought up the legal letter from the ADL. Later, one of the UAW's attorneys objected to Borowski informing the UAW of the threat for the ADL. Wait, what? Why? Yeah. Again, we're going to talk about who that was. While the 58-year-old veteran labor lawyer Nathaniel Carney, Carney, it's kind of funny, a felon convicted of conspiracy for obstruction of justice within the Teamsters in the 90s, Okay. Has played, he's played a key role in the legal department, okay? While he has played one, it was the Wait. much younger 36-year-old Jewish attorney, Benjamin Dichter, who sent a letter to Borowski. So basically, he's also a Zionist who got triggered. All right? That's what's going on here. You've got a Jewish attorney that's part of the UAW that doesn't like what's going on. That's This is... Okay. He says, we ask that such respect be mutual and that your office be respectful of the guardrails of your role and refrain from any further communications of the sort discussed in this email. Uh-huh. He's just trying to stonewall the guy. Yep. After Dichter's email, Dichter, all right, Borowski never mentioned the letter that he received from the ADL. So it worked. All right. But here's my favorite part and the reason why I brought this tonight. We all know Ryan Grimm very well. We all know that Ryan Grimm has um, tried to play both sides of the fence when it comes to, quote-unquote, being a, a lefty or a progressive. He calls himself one while he fillets billionaires and works for multiple of them simultaneously. I want to mention that he's already said that and they announced at the intercept that they would be drawing for, that they would be funding and supporting Ryan Grimm and Jeremy Scahill in their new effort called Drop Site News. So basically, they're rebranding the internet, the intercept on Substack and called it Drop Site News. And ooh, it's a whole new big thing. No, it's all the same people just brought over there and not paid by directly by Pierre Omidyar, but rather. Who knows how they're getting paid now, but they're still going to keep doing it. And by the way, they're still getting fed scoops. Who the hell leaves a big publications like that and gets more scoops than they had when they were there? Otto? Oh, right. You? What? You do? Autopilot does? Yeah. Uh-huh. How about I think that? so. Okay, Ryan. All right, so crying grim. No, not is, crying is grim. Auto, is autopilot is autopilot part of the uh, you know pilots pilots union? Who are the ones that tried to like do the teamsters? 
Yes, that was the UAW. Well, that was the uh, Alliance or um, Allegiant Airlines pilots. They tried to be Teamsters and they weren't right. being represented, so they joined the pilot team. We covered that a couple weeks That's ago. That's what it was. My my buddy Dennis mm. U. Pay Dennis U. Teamsters. Pay Dennis. Pay Dennis U. All right. Enough. Enough. Ryan Grimm, please. Ryan Grimm doesn't <laughs> disclose that his editor is married to the communications director, as we said. And it gets a little testy. He gets a little upset. On February 29th, which is actually the day that I interviewed the Amazon employees, the fired Amazon employees that were purged off the, the board. All right. Uh, Michelle Valentin Yavis and Ronald Boone. Shout out to all them. Nicole Druda and Chermo. I had a great conversation with them. If you haven't seen that, please go back and watch that. That's great. Great talk with them. So that day, the Detroit Free Press broke the news that UAW Treasure Secretary Treasurer Margaret Mock had been demoted for most of her assignments as labor leader in the UAW. That same day, Borowski right. sent a letter to the UAW asking for information about the demotion. She's the second ranking officer, and as we know, she's African American, and there have been problems with the person that's alongside Sean Fain being accused of insensitive to black issues when there is a, a large contention of black members. According to autopilot Ryan Grimm, Borowski's investigation of Mock's demotion came as direct retaliation for the union support of a ceasefire in Gaza. Forget about the fact that there actually is a culture of fear and, and there was a culture of corruption and they're, they need to be investigated, and that's his job. He, his article said that on February 29th, just six days after, Borowski sent a sweeping demand for documents saying he was opening an investigation into Fane and a dispute Fane had with the Secretary Treasurer. All right. However, labor law experts, including anti-Zionist ones like the University of St. Louis's Mike Duff, say that Borowski, as a lawyer, may have had merit in forwarding a potential legal threat from the ADL to the UAW. All of them said, I think forwarding a letter from the ADL out of concern that the union risked violating the anti-BDS law, leaving questions of constitutionality to one side, arguably fell within the monitor's legal ethical duty. Because if they weren't going to get funded by the New York State, mm -hmm. don't you say duty. duty. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> You're a child. But because if they don't yes, fall, I am. if they don't get paid out Google by the Gaga. state, if the state revokes their financial ability to raise money and to charge dues because of this thing, he's certainly within his responsibility to let them know. All right? Because, all right, some within the UAW have been pushing for the union to support BDS. However, concerns about legal and financial consequences have led to UAW International Executive Board members voting down BDS resolutions so far. If the UAW in its own international executive debates is worried about the legal and financial consequences of BDS, why would it be strange for their federal monitor to forward a legal threat from a Zionist organization known for suing critics of Zionism? It's crazy. He should. <laughs> Ryan, I need a haircut. Grimm wrote in his article that Borowski also asked for any and all emails, text messages, and instant messages sent between Fane, his top deputies, and his lawyers from February 12th through 23rd. That covers pretty much the exact time the UAW and Borowski were jockeying over the ADL's complaint about their call for a ceasefire. Again, nowhere does Grimm mention that Borowski's investigation was launched by a complaint filed by the UAW Secretary Treasurer. He may not even have known, but he certainly never asked and never reported it. Clearly, union members would want to know why the number two elected union official was demoted. Again, University of St. Louis labor law professor and anti-Zionist Mike Duff says it's hard to see Grimm establish that Borowski engaged in punitive measures against the UAW. It's a pretty vague threat, I can't understand what the union was being threatened with since the monitor could already ask for anything he already he wanted related to his function. The UAW, of course, did not return multiple requests for comment for this story. No surprise there. Borowski has denied ever expressing his views on Palestine. 
So the monitor, we don't know if he's a Zionist or not. He's staying quiet. But the evidence against him is merely that he forwarded a letter from the ADL, a controversial group that has sometimes stretched definitions of anti-Semitism to include anti-Zionism. Not sometimes. Yes. They literally had it passed in Congress. A Congress. Yep. Okay. Borowski again told the New York Times, quote, this false account is offensive and a, an obvious attempt to distract attention from the most recent report. We have adhered to standard norms of a monitorship in referring complaints to union leadership. It has nothing to do with his religion, their religion, or anybody else's religion, or their stance on massacres and ethnic cleansing and genocide, even though it's gross that there are members of UAW leadership that clearly are for genocide. Yep. No evidence exists tying Borowski to Zionist groups or expressing Zionist beliefs beyond him fulfilling his legal duty to forward the lawsuit threat from the ADL. However, Bain's allies on social media have repeatedly pointed to Borowski being praised by the World Jewish Congress. Why? For his work uh -huh. as a federal monitor of Credit Suisse when he investigated the bank's role in hiding Nazi money stolen from the Jews. So that makes him a Zionist? Even progressive activist and author Matt Stoller, who is also a Jewish and half a shit lib, I would call him a mid-lib, very good on monopolies, but really bad on a lot of other stuff, uh, says that he detests the ADL and feels that they manipulate anti-Semitism to support Israel's horrific war. And I agree. He says as someone, uh, jo um, Mike Elk says, as someone who was a staffer on Capitol Hill during the bailout, Stoller says that the attack on Borowski is a smokescreen designed to smear him for speaking out against the purges that Fain has initiated within his union. Don Fain must be protected at all costs for the Democrats. They can't have anybody else as their president, certainly not Will Lehman, that's going to stick his finger in the eye of the Democrats and leadership and the Republicans, for that matter. All right. He says, I worked with him during the financial who? crisis. Yeah, who? I worked with him during the financial crisis, and he showed immense integrity in standing up to the biggest bank in the world, as well as a lot of corrupt people in the, in the Obama administration, Stoller said. Borowski was heavily smeared by the Obama administration and faced threats that his role as special investigator of TARP would be defunded because he called out the big banks. He was very honest under immense pressure, and it would be hard for me, very hard for me, to imagine that he would be doing something unethical here. I've never seen him do that, and I've seen him under some pretty intense pressure. Like, what's his motivation? Afterward, Borowski published a book in 2012 titled Bailout, an inside account of how Washington abandoned Main Street while rescuing Wall Street, which is a widely read New York Times bestseller. I didn't know that. The book was a gripping account detailing how the Obama administration attempted to retaliate against him for accurately reporting on the bailout as Special in Inspector General. Now, he's got experience with this. He said, quote, I thought that if there was Obama. ever going to be... Yeah, Obama is right. I thought that if there was ever going to be a political figure that would take on the interests of Wall Street, it was going to be President Obama, and that just didn't happen. Yeah. His, his cabinet was literally chosen by Citigroup. It was the exact opposite of that. He had the same ideology as Secretary Tim Geithner, and frankly, the same ideology as a lot of those people who came from Wall Street. Hmm, I wonder why. Come on, people. Yeah. Borowski's forwarding of the ADL's threat occurred in February. So why would the UAW wait until they were in trouble for not turning over documents to raise this issue? Weird. Furthermore... If Borowski did engage in political interference, the federal judge has the power to remove him from the case. Given that parties in federal monitorship often record meetings, why would Borowski risk losing his federal monitorship by bringing this issue up? It literally makes no sense. It makes no sense. Currently, it's the word of Neil Borowski, who would face severe legal penalties if he was lying, Versus just one anonymous source who spoke to a reporter 
whose editor was married to the communications director at UAW. The UAW's own legal team has a checkered past, which would lead one to doubt their credibility. We learned about Nathaniel Charney, who was one of their top lawyers, who was responsible for helping to steer their legal strategy, again, was conspicted, convicted of conspiracy to engage in obstruction of justice by, a, by another federal monitor of the Teamsters in 1998. Literally, what's happening here, he got convicted of 25 years ago. How he's allowed mm. to do this again at the UAW, I have no idea. But Charney cooperated with federal authorities in their investigation and was able to keep his law license after an 18-month license suspension as punishment. So he took a little, a little slap on the wrist, was able to continue practicing, and now 25 years later, he's doing it again. The younger Jewish lawyer, Benjamin Dichter, who wrote a letter complaining about Borowski's forwarding of the legal threat from the ADL, I don't know why, again, what's the problem with him forwarding a letter? is also in Borowski's crosshairs, which he should be. Borowski has asked the federal judge for Dichter's and others UAW lawyers' emails and correspondence, which Dichter, of course, has resisted. Hey, phrasing! No, I, that's his last name. But he's resisted because of attorney-client privilege, of course. All right? Why? Well, after taking over as counsel of the New York News Guild, Dichter faced criticism from New York Times reporters for not presenting a yearly budget of legal expenses. <laughs> and we know why. Because an analysis by Payday Report of Federal Department of Labor financial records in July 2021 showed that legal costs doubled in the first year after he took over as union counsel. I wonder right. who he paid. Maybe his own firm? In 2020 alone, the union spent well, over six hundred twenty thousand dollars on outside legal costs instead of hiring a much cheaper in-house counsel, nearly doubling the three hundred thirty-five thousand spent by the New York News Guild in twenty nineteen. Even pro-union okay. labor law experts say that kind of union spending on outside legal counsel was excessive for a union local of only forty-two hundred members. $600,000 for, for only 4,200 members? <laughs> so, here's my favorite part. Payday Report asks Ryan Grimm, why didn't you reveal that your top editor was married to Jonah Furman? I don't think you understand how conflicts of interest work, said Grimm, and that it was widely known in the journalism industry. How would a rank-and-file UAW member reading Grimm's article know this Unless the conflict of interest was disclosed directly within the article, a fact that may have influenced his reporting. Grimm claimed that his publication's founding editor, Renner, <clears throat> a founding editor, wasn't directly involved in the granular work of editing the final article. Mm -hmm. However, as the publication's founding editor, she still allowed it to be published on her site without revealing her husband was the UAW communications director. Grimm repeatedly refused to answer questions about whether or not he worked directly with Jonah Furman, her husband. Over a period of three weeks, I attempted to engage Grimm and set up an interview with him to discuss this. He refused to answer most of my questions. Still, he did threaten to sue me if I got any facts wrong about how the founding editor of his publication was married to the UAW's communications director. He says, quote, do not defame my editor. We'll take it seriously. If your story is fair and accurate, great. But you're on notice. What a piece of shit. And he's got that in text. That's in writing. Every journalist's background and family connections shape the way they report. And it's important that they disclose this information. He says, for 17 years as a labor, labor reporter, I've always disclosed that my father, Gene Elk, is the retired director of the organization of the UE uh, United Electrical Workers. As a Jewish union leader, he worked to pass the first BDS resolution passed by any union in the country back in 2015. Even when writing for the New mm. York Times about how corruption in previous UAW administrations sunk a union drive at VW in Chatt Chattanooga in 2014, I revealed that my mother had been a UAW activist when she worked at VW in Western PA in the 1980s. 
For 11 years, I traveled back and forth to cover three major UAW attempts at their plant in Chattanooga because as the son of an auto worker, I know how important it was for rank and file auto workers to have accurate coverage. Following the historic union victory, the UAW has had an opportunity to organize non-union plants. Still, since the victory at Chattanooga, the UAW has stumbled, losing a narrow union election at Mercedes in Alabama. With the news of purges, uh, news of the purges and fear of intimidation within the UAW, one can't help but wonder if the infighting within the UAW is hurting their ability to take advantage of a historic moment to organize in the South. Because as, again, Federal Monitor Neil Borowski repeatedly warned, a culture of retaliation within the UAW could hurt the union's ability to achieve its goals. And again, he says, if left unchecked, these issues will inevitably impede the union's efforts to create a culture of compliance. No matter how strong its architecture of policies and procedures, the union cannot detect and pre prevent malfeasance, financial or otherwise, if such a sizable portion of its employees fear speaking up when they see it. Divisions within the union are also having a negative impact on union morale and, if left unaddressed, could further drag down the union's pace of reform. And again, the full 124-page <clears throat> report can be found linked from paydayreport.com. Payday support Mike Elk, support independent media, support you know, journalism that holds labor union bosses accountable. It's so important because they're running around acting like they're representing the people and the workers, and we know damn well that they're not. Um, let me also go here. Support independent media, like I said, because who else is telling you this story? Where else are they talking about this? Unless it's somewhere in a Republican district where they're trying to stick it to Sean Fain. All right? And, and we're not done with Sean Fain just yet because, <laughs> man, just today. Well, actually, before that. Okay. He's already he's already voted for said that they're going to endorse Harris. Right. Right. Let me close this. He says, when you compare Trump and Harris and what they've done for working class people, it's a very telling story. Except it's not the story that you really want to tell, of course. I said, or you could just say that they're both effing awful corporatists. But Sean absolutely refuses to do that. What a clown. This is how you fight for your base. By endorsing an anointed, unelected candidate with no concessions, because she's going to lose badly anyway, embarrassing. It's embarrassing. All right, but that's not all. Back in May, he claimed that the UAW would never support the mass arrest or Im intimidation of those exercising their right to protest. Uh-huh. This was about the Palestine protests. Mm -hmm. Now go vote, Now go vote for Joe Biden. What a clown. He's a media creation, a reformist who spoke for an entire union without asking what they thought first. I don't think he should have said free power. Mm. He shouldn't have said any of it without at least asking his union base what they wanted first and voting on it. He politicized the union, allied hard with Democrats and alienated Republicans as if there are none among their ranks. It's gross. All right. But beyond that, this clown, stand up UAW, we don't win by playing nice with the bosses. We win by giving working class people the tools, the inspiration, and the courage to stand up for themselves. A lot of fucking nothing, you clown. You stooge. And there, I'm telling him, he's a clown. All right? He sounds as vapid as Kamala Harris herself. Then, of course, we find out Sean tries to explain the facts behind the decision to endorse Kamala Harris for president. There are no facts. There's just your fifis, man. Because you never asked the union rank and file. Here's the short summary. He sold out without letting his members vote on it. Fuck you, Sean Fain. You're, you're garbage. And then finally, just today. Oh, oh. Right, thank you. No, actually on Friday, I see this one. He's now recommending who he would like to see as Kamala's Potential running mate? First of all, 
Forget the fact that he's now, after having the fewest votes of any union president in the history of the country, now endorsing someone who's literally had zero votes from their base. It's hilarious. <laughs> Welcome to the Democratic this is Party, the folks. the election of our lifetime. All right. And here's what I said. Why is he even getting involved in party politics at all? Shut up and represent your base against the bosses. What the actual fuck are you idiots doing? What the actual fuck? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. When you learn about Sean Fain, what you learn about Sean Fain in the UAW and INN, it's very telling. Because you don't hear about this. Nobody else wants to do this. They all want to tongue bathe them. They all want to kiss the work. They think that he represents the workers and that they're kissing the workers' ass by elevating and supporting this clown. When he's knifing them in the back constantly. All right? Anna Mayers, it's like the squad pretending to hate war. The illusion people in power give a fuck about you. It's all a grift, J.J. Bibbs. And where's my barbecue sauce already? Amen on that. We need to make J.J. Bibbs barbecue sauce. Bad cookies. Ha! Ryan Grimm we'll didn't disclose that. important information? Say it ain't so, lol. Um, yeah, here. He says that it's widely known. like J.J. Bibbs. J.J. Bibbs is going to have to have, like, baked apple in it. You know? Well... Yes, definitely, definitely need some of that. Roasted, there. roasted, or baked apple, or some kind of some kind of apple thing. Yes, yeah. Um, emergency orange is now Anna's favorite color for obvious reasons. Yes, cynic again, widely known by the people whose job it is to cover it up. Yes, that's that's exactly in journalism. It's widely known in journalism. Yeah, but how about the people that are actually reading this that would be able to take action? They are represented. No, no. Nah. Nah. Um, Anna also says, I literally wrote my college senior thesis, picking apart the movie A Bug's Life, and 20 years later, and we still haven't learned our lesson, go rewatch it. It's insane. Yeah. That's uh, a great that's movie. Pixar, Pixar, right? No. I don't think so. Maybe. But I think Dreamcast or whatever. Mm. Possibly. Could be wrong. Yeah. I might be thinking of the other bug bug movie. Anna wants Granny Smith, but, but Je Jesse usually smokes out of a red apple, so that's definitely not not a uh, a granny. We support independent media. We are totally user funded. We really appreciate the people that hang out in chat. They are the people that make this network and this channel what it is. And without you guys, we don't really exist. I mean, we we do we would do this even if it was just us. We started out just us, but. Man, we really need we need all that that support that you can give us. So we we really appreciate that. We got that QR code up there. Uh, we talked about this last week, but we're gonna have uh, the Zago brothers create some cartoon art. They they started. They've gotten already about fifteen Indie Media Award honorees. They had done on this poster called Truth Tellers. Hey, how about that? IndieMediaAwards.substack.com. You can see the whole list, but. Um, those are the best of the best in independent media from live streamers to journalists to outlets and video creators. We have a list with all of their links and ways to find and support them. And we're going to do something special this year. We teamed up with Zago brothers to uh, create cartoon illustrations of each indie media award honoree and even some people to represent some of the outlets. We were trying to figure out what to do. And uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, so that's what the Q the QR code and the Kofi is going to go towards is uh, is supporting that with with Zago and paying him for for his time and for his work. 